Hello and welcome to lecture 10 for AC 1002. Uh, this lecture talks about ground bearing floors um, and it will work in tandem with the, the next lecture which is um, on an alternative method to, to uh, constructing floors. So you need to understand both to be able to figure out which one the best option is. So as I said there's two main types of floors used in domestic construction. There's a ground bearing floor and you can generally think about this as the, the weight of the floor, the, all the layers that make up the floor are carried directly to the ground below. Or there's a suspended floor, which you might find is in um, older properties or some timber frame properties, where uh, there's a void underneath the floor. If you lifted up the floorboards, there would be a space to be able to crawl and put services and, and that kind of thing into. So we'll be looking at the ground bearing floor in this lecture and the following lecture is the suspended floor. So a ground bearing floor is constructed from layers of material. It's very rare to find uh, uh, any part of construction where everything is just handled by one material. So um, a ground bearing floor is no different. It's constructed from layers of material which pass their load directly to the ground below the house. Um, so they don't rely on the timber kit and they don't rely on the foundations to be able to take the weight of themselves down to the ground. In domestic construction, ground bearing slabs are commonly installed with insulation below them, uh, though in some cases you might put insulation above a concrete slab and uh, that would then allow for underfloor heating to be put above that within a separate uh, smaller scrab, uh, slab which is called a screed. The floor requires a complete seal by way of a DPM to prevent the floor, uh, to protect the floor from moisture rising up from the ground. So if you imagine that there's, there's, there's water in the soil underneath the, the ground, we need to be able to protect the construction from uh, mo that moisture rising up through it. So we have a DPM, which is a damp proof membrane, but that'll, that'll uh, be explained in this lecture. So the benefits of a ground bearing slab are that uh, because we don't need a space underneath it, we can install it pretty much at external ground level. So for accessibility, ramps, people in wheelchairs, uh, elderly homes, it means that they could actually get into their house without having to, to uh, negotiate steps or, or ramps. We can also put a continuous layer of insulation below the slab. So the slab itself, big concrete slab, will rest on rigid insulation. So there's no cold bridges. And cold bridges I'll explain in another lecture further on, but effectively it's a space where heat can escape, where there's no insulation. It can also form a solid base, so we can put other partitions up. We can divide up rooms without having to have foundations below them. And we can finish floor in a variety of materials. We could uh, polish the concrete, we can lay carpet over the top, we can lay timber boards. Um, all sorts of stuff can go on top of it. So it's got a number of advantages and a number of benefits. So the first thing we have to do is, if we're, if we're building any building really, um, but for a ground bearing floor, we need to remove material which could possibly damage the construction in the future. And on a lot of drawings you'll see notes that say things like remove vegetable matter and they're not speaking about carrots and onions and turnips, they're speaking about roots and leaves and bits of twig and that kind of thing. Anything that could possibly rot away in the future and cause a void underneath a floor and a void's a potential weak spot in a slab where if we were to put a point load on it, if there was a void underneath it, it could crack because it wouldn't be fully, fully uh, supported. So we need to get in there first of all with a digger and uh, dig away all that material. So we've got our site um, and we can dig down through the, the, the grass and the material through the topsoil which is the bit that contains the vegetable matter to, to reach the subsoil. And if you've ever dug holes in your garden you'll discover that there's different layers of soil and they look slightly different. So if you go down about two feet um, you'll you'll find much harder material and it's got less sort of rotten vegetables or roots or, or, or stuff through it and that's called the, the topsoil and sometimes you'll refer to that as hard pan. So we've we can clear away that that site and get ourselves down to down to that hard pan material. The next 
point that we need to do is we need to put in a sub base and this is a, a kind of compacted leveling material uh, we refer to it as either uh, hardcore or MOT type 1 um, the MOT comes from Ministry of Transport because they wrote the specification on how big granular fill should be um, and you're looking for a uh, hardcore which is crushed stones um, it shouldn't have any organic material because in the same way that anything underneath the slab from the site clearance will, will rot away if there's anything in that that uh, will rot away and potentially cause a void then that, that should be removed um, we'd also look to not just pour this stuff in we have to compact it down we have to make sure that, that all the stones um, sort of knit together or cling together into a kind of dependable matrix which can't be compressed and we would do that in layers of about 150 millimeters so you generally draw 150 millimeters of hardcore underneath a floor um, but if you need more if you need 300 millimeters then you have to do it in two layers so you shouldn't be doing any more than 150 millimeters at a time so that's our, our kind of drawing building up um, Hardcore we would usually show as a kind of zigzag layer. So in a drawing you would you would have these zigzags and that would show that it was it was hardcore in a section. Um, but because hardcore has very uh, sharp surfaces and we're going to have to put a membrane over the, the top at some point, um, we need to blind the surface. So we would get um, a finer sand and lay a, a, a layer over the top of this, uh, rake it down and compact it again and that would take all the sharp surfaces away and also bring any uneven levels up to a point where we could be confident that there was a level surface for the for the floor and that would go over the whole of the the, the uh, hardcore sub base. So you've typically got about 50 millimeters of, of that, uh, five zero millimeters um, over the top of that, but it could be more um, in certain places where the leveling needs to take place. And then on top of that, we would install our damp proof membrane. And damp proof membrane prevents moisture from the ground penetrating up through the, the, the floor construction. So everything below that, the sub base, the, the blinding, is, is effectively wet or, or has the potential to be wet. And the, the DPM is essentially a big plastic layer, polythene, uh, impenetrable, like a really thick plastic bin bag, effectively. Um, and you would lay this out in, in rows and the seam that you see down the middle of this, this screen here would be taped over um, with, a, with a specialist double-sided tape and then the tape would be sealed again so that there's no possibility of moisture getting through. And in some cases where we have uh, radon gas, so round about Aberdeen there's a lot of granite and uh, there's a potential for, for uh, radioactive gas to come up through the, the, the ground, we can have the DPM as a, a gas barrier, a radon gas barrier, which stops that, that gas entering the house. So that would go on top of the, the, the blinding as the this a third layer of our construction. And onto that, we would probably put uh, insulation, or in this example, we're going to put insulation. And we, it's on the warm, uh, on the uh, the dry side of the the construction, so it's above the top of the DPM. And usually, we would use rigid boards of synthetic insulation. Um, there's a lecture later in the series on synthetic and man-made insulation. But in fact, effectively, sorry, uh, synthetic and natural insulation, but effectively synthetic insulation is, is a man-made material from uh, petrochemicals. And we would use a, a material which is able to, to take the load of a slab and us walking about and putting furniture and that kind of stuff onto it. So it has to be quite rigid, otherwise it will deform underneath the slab. And then over the top of that, we pour our concrete floor slab itself. Um, now depending on the function of the concrete floor slab we would probably be looking somewhere between 125 millimeters and 150 millimeters. Um, so for instance if you were doing a floor slab for a, a, a garage and you wanted to drive cars onto it then you probably have something quite a little bit thicker so you maybe go, go towards the 150 millimeter end 
Um, if it's just for a domestic property, 125 millimetres is, is, is more than sufficient. And there's normally reinforcement um, into the bottom here, and you can see these guys are standing uh, onto, it's actually a beam and block floor they're, they're standing onto, but they're pouring concrete, and into the concrete um, embedded uh, within the bottom of it, there is a metal mesh, um, a steel mesh, uh, because slabs are very much like, like beams, and if you remember back to the, the earlier lecture on structures, we have um, tensile forces and compressive forces, and concrete's very good in compression, so that's the top part of the slab, effectively. But as we put load onto it, the bottom part tries to pull apart under bending, so we need something which can help it deal with those tensile forces, so we put a, a steel reinforcement at the bottom. So there's our, our, our slab working its way up, um, and pretty much we've got to the kind of finished level. The only thing to do now is to think about what we put on the top. Um, but it's important to figure out how long you need to leave before you can put something on top of the concrete. Um, concrete, as a rule of thumb, a very rough rule of thumb, dries at uh, one millimetre per day. So if you have a slab that's 125 millimetres thick, it's going to take 125 days to, uh, to fully dry. Um, and really you shouldn't put any flooring over the top of it. So you, you really have to wait for it to have gone off before you can finish it. And it's finished in a number of different ways. We can uh, apply carpet, tile, timber flooring, um, whatever, whatever is possible. Um, or whatever your client would want can go over the top of it. But um, you need to make sure it's, it's completely dry. There are ways to speed up the, the drying process, and if you've got underfloor heating, you can uh, slowly turn on the underfloor heating to increase the drying rate. Um, if it dries out too quickly, it will crack. Um, so it's a, a kind of careful balancing of the, the, the quality of the finished product and the speed of construction. So that's our flooring on top there, that, that uh, light uh, brown layer. And that pulls this lecture to an end. So in conclusion, a uh, ground bearing slab, a solid ground bearing slab is a common way of constructing a ground floor and is useful in creating a level floor which doesn't depend on the surrounding walls for support. Um, we also don't have a void beneath it. So it's useful where the ground needs to be close to the outside ground level the, a variety of floor finishes are to be overlaid and cracking is to be avoided and there's no need for a service void underneath. Um, we haven't spoken about thermal mass um, and that's probably more for semester two but we can use thermal mass within a, a slab um, as part of the heating strategy of a building. Okay, so the next lecture covers the uh, suspended floor, so the two of them will work in together. Okay, thanks very much for listening.